All right. Yes. So a one minute. And <clears throat> as uh, 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 assimilate by Medversity was looking for a cardiometabolic KC. So I thought I'll come up with you guys uh, with an interesting case, and we'll, we'll we'll take a case which gets a little complicated en route, and uh, and we'll try to see how this case gets solved. So this would be a case of acute kidney injury with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, a patient who's complicated with diabetic foot ulcers with neuropathy in the background setting of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. And I think most of us definitely see these kind of cases in our clinical practice. So this case will develop around two visits of the patient and their diagnostic tests and management mentioned here are one of the approaches of the many possible approaches. So it's nothing uh, you know, straightforward that this is all that you have to do. There is other ways that you can approach the case. And I'll be taking you through one of the management options uh, which, which we carried out for this patient. And, uh, and then we can have this uh, forum for discussion. So what are the learning objectives through this case is to elaborate on the management strategy of acute kidney injury uh, in the set of type 2 diabetes and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, whenever we talk about cardiometabolic, we definitely mean cardiorenal metabolic. So the, the renal component does come in. And especially when you know when you're looking at a patient with, with long-standing diabetes, with advanced diabetes, they definitely have some degree of renal impairment in the form of either microalbuminuria or proteinuria, or even they have some grades of chronic kidney disease into them. We're also going to look at the understand the treatment for hypertension and diabetic neuropathy in patients with type 2 diabetes. So this is this is going to be sort of going through the guidelines as well as looking at a real case scenario. So we're going to look at a little bit of an ICU setting because that's where an acute emergency comes. So you're looking at a 60-year-old male who was brought to the emergency department with complaints of breathlessness and palpitation. And uh, the patient complained of sudden onset breathlessness and palpitation at rest for about a day or two. And at the same time, he started having less urine output over the last 24 hours. Going back, the patient is also suffering from a painful ulcer for the last two months, which ultimately developed into a non-healing ulcer with foul-smelling discharge on the left foot for the last seven days. There's been no complaint of fever, chest pain, confusion, abdominal pain, nocturia, or dribbling of urine. Remember these symptoms, uh, negative symptoms, or uh, I mean, it's very important because when you say the patient didn't have fever, chest pain, you're definitely kind of ruling out any acute uh, AMI. You're, with fever, you're trying to rule out whether the patient is into sepsis or not. Abdominal pain, nocturia, dribbling of urine would probably indicate, you know, some kind of an obstructive uropathy, or it could also indicate a UTI. There's also no history of hematuria. So these negative symptoms are also very important. Uh, especially, you know, uh, when you want to take the history of a patient at uh, the emergency department, we often focus on the positive history, but the negative histories are also useful in helping us exclude certain diseases. So what this patient was on, let's try to understand the medical history. So you have this patient who's been diabetic for about 15 years, and this patient was being treated with human insulin premix prior to meals and oral metformin 1000 milligram twice a day. So he was on uh, metformin and premixed human insulin. Hypertension was there for the last 10 years, and he was being treated with atenolol 50 milligram once a day and enalapril 10 milligram twice a day. So these are quite, as per guidelines, the patient is on an ACEI with atenolol. The patient is on insulin with metformin. Ongoing, uh, ongoing neglected wound was there for the last two months, which developed finally into a non-heating ulcer with foul swelling discharge on the left foot since seven days. And that was being treated with amoxicillin clavulanic acid, ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, and acyclofenac, diclofenac, uh, acyclofenac paracetamol combination twice a day. Now, remember one thing is very important here, and this is the reason why I kept this foot problem in this case, is not all foot problems or foot ulcers, which is non-healing, they're not necessarily going to be infected. Even if they have a foul smelling uh, discharge, it doesn't necessarily mean they're infected. So sometimes you know, in our daily practice, we have a habit of using uh, you know, inadvertent antibiotics on foot ulcers. That sometimes leads to antibiotic resistance and it also hurts the kidney and the liver. So it's very important in diabetic foot patients, whenever you're starting an antibiotic, get a culture done, confirm whether it's actually an infected wound and then only start the antibiotic. 
Along with this, the patient also had diabetic neuropathy for the last six months, and the patient was being treated with pregabalin 75 milligram and multivitamin, and this would probably be a vitamin B12 that the patient was on. So this is your case history of the patient. The past history, what, what, what was there? The patient's sister was on treatment with diabetes. So diabetes runs in the family. Uh, parents had diabetes and they died of old age. So a uh, patient is a retired bank employee and lives with his wife. He drinks alcohol occasionally and is a smoker. So the smoker is a very important history because this exposes the patient to risk of coronary artery disease as well as peripheral artery disease. This is very important. And he's the banker is a retired bank employee, so he must be having a sedentary lifestyle uh, and looking at his foot ulcers, looking at his neuropathy. He's definitely been ignoring his diabetes for quite some time. Allergy history, no known drug allergies are there. So what did the patient come to us with? Once again, let's review. Patient had breathlessness and palpitation for one day and oliguria for one day. So it's short duration, one day or two day history of breathlessness and palpitation. And at the background, there is a running... Uh, you know, there is a painful foot ulcer with foul smelling discharge, which is going for the last one week. Again, very important negative history is that the patient didn't have fever, chest pain, nocturia or dribbling of urine. So definitely this rules out sepsis because the patient didn't come to you with fever. They would have definitely had a fever if there was likely to be sepsis, at least some, some degree of, uh, uh, you know, fever would be there. And of course, nocturia, dribbling of urine. So obstructive uropathy symptoms are getting ruled out here. And whenever the patient comes with breathlessness, palpitation, if there is no chest pain, you're obviously trying to allow the episode of AMI associated with it. So these are some negative history. Now, <clears throat> when you get a case like this in your emergency department, you would like to evaluate the patient. And let's see what this patient had. Uh, so this patient had about... Uh, uh, he was a little overweight. Uh, his BMI was 26.7. As we said, the patient was complaining of palpitation, so he had tachycardia, but the pulse was regular. And that's important. Respiration was about 25 to 28 per minute, so slightly tachypneic, you can say. Not, not exactly, but slightly tachypneic. His blood pressure was maintained. He was febrile. That's very important. Saturation was being maintained. Now, this patient was found to be in acute distress and there was periorbital edema was noted, but there was no cyanosis pallorectoris. And his left leg is swollen and tender. That was probably because of cellulitis. And also, the dorsalis pedis pulsation were feeble. So that is, that is also a matter of concern. When you examine the patient, the cardiovascular system, you can see there is evidence of heart failure. His S1 and S2 is hurt, but there's an S4 gallop. Uh, there is a displaced, uh, laterally displaced apical impulse. There's an apical heave elevated JVP are noted. So all the clinical findings have been put here. Now, you may not get these. This is a sort of an ideal case to give you a understanding of what are the clinical findings that would be there. You may not get this in every patient, but this is just a sort of a simulated experience for us to discuss on the points. The, the respiratory sounds, uh, definitely there was fine basal crepitation, which is very common. In, in, in most of the patients you get with heart failure. Per abdominal, there is uh, normal bowel sounds being heard and there's a little bit of tender hepatomegaly. Very important, a fundoscopy uh, could be done. Now this fundoscopy may be done in the emergency. It's not possible sometimes. It may have been done earlier, but you find that there is a grade two retinopathy is there. Uh, patient is conscious oriented. There is no neuro deficit. And um, also, there is loss of vibration and pain prick sensation in the lower limb. So that means the patient is in a state of advanced neuropathy. And definitely that has led to a foot ulcer, which is most of the common, common times they are neuro ischemic ulcers, as we have seen. The left lower limb, there is a two by two centimeter ulcer on the plantar aspect of the foot with copious slough and purulent discharge. And as I as the fundoscopy has been already said, that there is uh, evidence of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This also gives us an example. You know, you can actually keep a you know fundus camera with you. And you can keep an ophthalmoscope with you, and it's if you can really have the option of keeping that, it's sometimes very useful. Uh, may not be ideal in the emergency setting, but in an OPD setting, it's it's quite helpful if you can just quickly look at the the fundus and you can get a great idea about you know how the fundus gets affected because of diabetes and hypertension. Now. Uh, in the acute settings, what are the clinical findings in this patient? So you can see here, uh, <clears throat> the patient had about uh, 10,500 WBC count. Slight neutrophilia was there. 
hemoglobin was oh, normal and uh, blood sugar was not very steady. He had an A1C of 8.5. And definitely the renal function was impaired here. Creatinine was 3.0 with urea going up to 85. And obviously, because the patient presented to you with breathlessness, you would want to do an NT pro BNP, and that came elevated to 920. The metabolic electrolyte parameters, sodium was 128, calcium 7.8, slightly lower, and potassium was on the higher side. This would possibly be because of the AKI, 5.8, phosphate 5.5, and also there was hypoalbuminemia going on in this patient. Patient was having albuminuria, urine ACR was 350. And at this point in the emergency, the ACR, uh, the EGFR calculated came to be up at about 12 milliliter per minute. So remember, this is very important. Again, whenever you are checking these patients and you do a sort of, <clears throat> um, you know, the assessment of the renal parameters, a quick calculation using the, uh, you know, Cockcroft Gold method or the MDRD formula, you can quickly calculate the EGFR. Those calculators are easily available. And that gives you a good insight about the stages of CKD or AKI that the patient is on because that side on, the, the dosing of the medication that you're going to go give to the patient going ahead. Urine analysis after catheterization, patient had about turbid acidic urine with protein and granular casts, and the pus culture uh, uh, was done, which came out to be sterile. So obviously this was a later finding. This is not an immediate finding because the culture would come in 48 hours. So again, see uh, if you are doing the pus culture from the, from the wound, most of the time if the patient is on inadvertent antibiotics, if you do a culture later on, you don't do any bacteria. So most of the time, this inadvertent use of antibiotic leads to drug resistance coming on. So uh, ECG had sinus tachycardia, X-ray had mild cardiomegaly, no pleural effusion. And the echocardiogram shows clearly that there was preserved ejection fraction, diastolic dysfunction grade one is quite common in patients of this category. What about the ultrasound? The ultrasound was no urinary stones or prostate hypertrophy noted. Remember, you're trying to exclude obstructive uropathy in this kind of cases, and the kidney size was found to be normal. So definitely the patient didn't have any uh, impaired uh, or increased renal ecogenicity at this point of time. The renal Doppler was also done, which is normal, and the X-ray of the foot was normal with no signs of osteomyelitis. Again, very important take-home point is whenever you are examining a patient with foot ulcer, it's very important that you get an x-ray done to see that the bone is very, very important. The ulcer might not look that bad, but in, inside the bone might get affected and your entire treatment strategy will have to change. So please get an x-ray done to look for any signs of osteomyelitis in a patient with diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, in the non-acute settings, uh, previously you can see uh, this, this patient had got about... Uh, low hemoglobin and platelets, and CRP was, was normal, the lipid panel was normal, and X-ray had mild cardiomegaly, X-ray we have discussed, and the foot uh, discharge culture, no bacteria was detected, and also the urine had no culture. So basically, you're trying to uh, rule out whether the symptoms are because of any uh, infection or not. So definitely, there was no evidence of any infection as per the uh, you know, uh, uh, as per the culture reports. So this looks like a case of uh, definitely some degree of heart failure because there was breathlessness, there's anti-proBNPs raised, and definitely you have a patient who is into an acute kidney injury. What is a very important point to learn here is what was the baseline creatinine? So that, that, that value needs to be looked into and what has been the rise in the creatinine in the acute setting. So what could be the diagnosis in this kind of a patient? So the doctor has already given us the symptom, the diagnosis has to yeah. be given by you. So please write it on the chat box. What do you think after seeing all the symptoms? He's already given you the case history. He's already given you the chief complaints. And he has already given you the concerns which was taken care of. So please write it on the chat box. According to you, what is the diagnosis in this patient? Doctor, we'll give them 30 to 40 seconds. Sure, to absolutely. Them. Yeah, then we can discuss the diagnosis. Multiple organ dysfunction, AKI. 
with multiple organ dysfunction. Okay, right. So let's see what we have. So definitely we are looking at a patient with AKI, that's for sure. So this is this would be your diagnosis because your patient definitely has got an AKI on diabetic kidney disease. So that's what I said, the baseline pre uh, uh, we need to know to confirm that whether this was a diabetic kidney disease or not. So uh, along with that, you have a patient with a diabetic foot, but remember this diabetic foot okay. ulcer is a non-infected so, ulcer. We yes. have one more answer. Diabetes yeah. mellitus 2 with AKI, with electrolyte imbalance, with neuropathy, with neuro nephropathy. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, looking at a diabetic foot ulcer, and this foot ulcer at this moment doesn't look infected. That's very important. Or maybe it was infected. The patient was already on an antibiotic regime. If you remember in this background history, we said that patient was already on an amoxicillin clavulinate uh, with, I think, metronidazole as a, as a medication that the patient was already on prior to this. And also what was important is the patient was also on a painkiller. Patient was on acetophenac and paracetamol combination because remember, in the beginning of the history, I'd said that this patient has a painful ulcer. So this ulcer was painful. It was painful as well as because of the neuropathy. So patient was constantly suffering with a neuropathy pain. So yes, you're definitely looking at a case of acute kidney injury uh, with diabetic foot ulcer. The leg was swollen, so there could have been cellulitis. And because your NT pro BNP is raised, there is evidence of heart failure in your clinical examination. There is definitely a look at a case of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this definitely exists. You know, you get patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction getting hospitalized. That's why the term hospitalization failure, you know, exists in, in uh, you know, in medical research when you're looking at drugs which can reduce or prevent this hospitalization due to heart failure. And yes, like one of you rightly pointed out, this patient definitely has got diabetic neuropathy, quite severe, painful neuropathy, painful peripheral neuropathy, that's what the patient has, and in the background setting of type 2 diabetes and hypertension. So I think at this point of time, we all agree with the diagnosis that we are looking at a case of acute kidney injury with heart failure, with neuropathy, with a diabetic foot ulcer in diabetes background and hypertension. Now let's move ahead, right? So. Uh, my slide. So, yeah. Now the next question to all of you is, and I want most of, I want all of you to participate and answer this before I share the answer is which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's presentation. Now, you know, this patient is suffering from acute kidney injury and what could be the possible cause of this acute kidney injury? You have four options. One is drug induced AKI, urinary tract infection, is it renovascular disease or is it chronic kidney disease? So request all of you to please go ahead and write your answer. And then we can discuss the right option. Okay. So we have one more question here. Uh, the option here is C, renovascular disease. Okay. Renovascular disease, drug-induced AKI. Renovascular disease. So the maximum people have written renovascular disease. Option C. All right. So, uh, okay, we're still getting some answers. So yeah, we see. are getting some answers. So I think two or three people agree with drug induced AKI, and maximum uh, maximum of them are going with option C, that is renovascular disease. So you see here, uh, before I read, uh, sort of disclose the answer to you, and it's very interesting that you've got a mixed response. Uh, I think this makes this kind of exercise uh, exercises more uh, the reason why you sh we should have more discussions like this. Uh, whenever you have a case, uh, whenever you have a patient is suddenly deteriorating, there is usually an insult. There is an, there is an insult, and that insult would either, ideally be either infection or most of the time, sometimes a drug. So if you look at this patient's history, uh, this patient was taking uh, acetophenac and paracetamol for pain. And uh, that was a very important history, actually. Besides that, this patient was obviously on antibiotics uh, in the full doses. Uh, so again, that's very important that you uh, estimate the EGFR before starting the antibiotics for the patient. 
but cyclofenac been taken for very long and we don't know for how long because remember this patient has been suffering with uh, you know uh, painful neuropathy in the history they said by six months the patient may have been having it much longer and usually when these kind of patients gives you a history that they've been taking NSAIDs or painkillers that is usually the insult that is usually the cause of sudden acute kidney injury and that is usually most of the time the most common cause is acute kidney injury is the drugs and out of the drugs the most common drug is uh, NSAIDs Besides that, there could be other drugs, sometimes the antibiotics, if they're not used in the proper renal dose. Now, infection, as I said, we have tried to rule out because your cultures were all coming negative. Renovascular disease or chronic kidney disease can worsen under an acute setting. Now, the acute setting would require an insult, and that insult would either be a sepsis or an infection, or it would be some kind of an insult like which is being triggered by a drug. So in this case, uh, this looks more of a drug-induced AKI than an infection or than a long-standing uh, you know, chronic kidney disease or a, a vascular disease of the kidney getting worsened. So most of you, some of you who said drug-induced AKI have actually said the correct answer. <laughs>